My name is Edgar Perez. And I'm Leonel Landeros. Uh, Marco Montemayor is our videographer today. Daniel Weiss could not be with us today. Today is May 11, 2018. We are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we will be interviewing Ms. Janai McLaughlin. Ms. McLaughlin, thank you for uh, doing this for us, and we're going to uh, start right away with asking you uh, to describe something, the earliest childhood memory that you, that you remember. Earliest childhood memory that I remember, uh, this is a funny one, this comes to my mind right now. I was sitting on the front porch with a dog, and, and I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and the dog all of a sudden went down the stairs and turned and I went with the dog and I chipped my front tooth. That's one of my first childhood memories. All right, so it looks like you have a relationship with your dogs. Do you have pets, other pets? Just dogs. When we were little kids, we had a cat, and, but as time went on, we just went to dogs. All right, so I'm assuming you also had family in your, in your household uh, as a child. I did. I had uh, two brothers. One was six years older than I was. And the other one is currently, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the one was two years older than I was, and the younger one is six years younger than I am. How were your relationships with your, with your older brother and your younger brother? Well, with my older brother, we both went, you know, we were only two years a, a, apart in school, so we, got, we had a lot of the same friends, and, you know, we went to different events, basketball games and stuff together. But my younger brother was six years old, and that made a difference. So um, he didn't share that kind of relationship, but um, we tried to include him as much as we could. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, you had both of your parents in your, in your house? Yes, yes, um, mom and a dad. My, mom, my dad uh, was, my older brother was born right after World War II. He came out of the, my dad came out of the Navy, and within the next year they were married, and um, my older brother was born. Uh, and with the next couple of years. And my mom, uh, my dad was from Pennsylvania, and he came out to Detroit for work. And my mother was born and raised in a German family in Detroit, Michigan. So what did your father dedicate his life to as and what profession did he have? And did your mother have a profession as well? Yes. My mother, my dad was a blue collar worker. So he was a tool and die man in, in a local factory. And my mother was, um, uh, she was a very bright woman, but, um, and she actually went to college when she was 15, and uh, Wayne State University, but she was too young and she just was, they didn't have any special programs or anything. So she came back home and then the war started. Uh, before that, she became a, a professional hairstylist, okay? Then, as the war started, they asked her in a local factory to be to work for the government. She didn't know what the job was, and she was the one that they eventually it was you know top secret. She was the one that allocated all uh, all the copper for um, the atomic bomb, so she was able to um, really do whatever she wanted to do. And she couldn't. She wasn't even responsible to the men working there, and it was all men in you know in charge. I think uh, I, the thing with my mom is she really liked doing that and she was very bright, she was using her talent, but as soon as the men came home, well then the women had to leave those jobs. So I think that she would have liked to stay on to work, let's put it that way. So what importance uh, did your parents have in your life? Yeah. Well I think a uh, well, major thing was um, uh, religion, I mean we all, uh, I went and my older brother went to public schools when we were kids or into junior high and then went to Catholic high schools, at junior high and Catholic high schools. And my younger brother went all the way through in Catholic high school. So religion was very important in our house. Uh, hard work was important in our house. We had a responsibility to do, you know, do well in school, do well at home, chores, that kind of thing. And uh, respect for other people was important, you know, in our home, so. Did you have any other family members in your household? Uh, I had an uncle, uh, and at that time, I think he might have been a distant cousin. I never knew how he fit into the picture. And um, he was a very interesting guy. He was from Pennsylvania also, and uh, but he wasn't my dad's brother. He was on my mom's side. And uh, he got his master's from University of Michigan in, in music and decided to work in a hardware store. 
So he work at, worked in a hardware store for one of my great uncles in Detroit. And then eventually he came and lived with us. And he was there a couple of years and then he died of a sudden heart attack. So um, he was there, but that was him and then was my mom, dad, and my uncle and us three kids. So your household seems like a very full family, brothers, um, you have a sister, uh, mother, father, and even uncle. Uh, what were some of the things that your family liked to discuss as you were a child, even yeah. as you grew up? Yeah. Um, we always had to have supper together. That was very important. And um, sometimes we just discuss the day at school or my dad talk about work a little bit. Um, my mom and dad both thought it was very important that we got a good education. So I think my dad in particular, because he left high school when he was a sophomore because uh, by that time his mother and dad were both dead and the two older brothers, he had, uh, he had an older brother, and they, my, mom, my grandma and grandpa had a store in Pennsylvania and so they quit high school and took over the store because they had to take care of the two younger sisters. So my dad really thought education was extremely important. You know, he really wanted us to go on to higher education. Um, some of the things uh, as time went on when we got in high school and that, uh, uh, keep in mind that that was the 60s and then we're, uh, I was home till 66, my brother was home till 64. Um, then my younger brother was home for a while, but um, things were starting to brew, you know, in terms of racial tensions and, and my dad was, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, my dad was very racist. And he, his thinking was always this, you know, I made it, they can make it. And, it, you know, it, color didn't enter into my, my dad's mind at all. And I think it was my younger brother, he was the one that <laughs> would challenge him more. He did say, well, what if they're a different color? Oh, that doesn't make any difference. No, no, no. So, so it was really tough talking to my dad about issues like that because he, you know, he felt he was right and he did it and the rest of everybody else should do it too. So it, it, he just didn't have any room for really empathy for other people and other cultures. Uh, my mother, she didn't say much. Um, in fact, I, I've never heard her say a lot about racial slurs or anything like that, whereas my dad did, yeah. Would you say that they kind of disagreed and, and only that? And uh, my mother never disagreed with them. She kept quiet. But, um, and then at that time, it's a good question because at that time, you know, the woman's role was pretty much listen and not say too much. And so she didn't say much. I, I really, I, I can honestly say, I don't ever know what she, where she stood on, on racial integration or any of that. Yeah. So you previously mentioned that your mother came from a German family. Yes. And do you feel like you were very participative in this German culture, or, or what was your thoughts about your German side of the okay. family? Okay. What was important to know when we were growing up is uh, people that came over here wanted to be not German, not Irish, not French, not Italian, not Lithuanian. They wanted to be Americans, okay? So my mother, they taught my mother, she was born and raised in Detroit, they taught her, well, they, their only language at home was German, okay? And so they got her into a German immersion school that taught English while they spoke German. So, um, you know, that's one way she, you know, learned English, okay? Um, the focus wasn't on, like, and I think in this day and age, different cultures and how, you know, how wonderful it is to understand culture and people's understanding of the world and that kind of thing. At that time, you're, you're, the big thing was you're an American, you know. And I think part of it came from World War II, you know, that you are an American and, you know, you know assimilate yourself and that's it. Uh, was there, Germ like, there was some German cooking, there was, uh, when their relatives were over, they would talk in German, but it, you know, we never talked in German in the house. There were some words I picked up in that, but uh, no, you didn't, you know, there's very little things except some of the cooking, uh, but my mother would never say, well, this is how the Germans did it or whatever. You never got any of that. Okay, so now we're, we, I want to touch on the neighborhood that you grew up in. Um, what was your neighborhood like overall, and maybe the demographics, or, or did you see any problems in your neighborhood? Uh, no, there's different ethnicities. 
Um, you know, when we were kids, you know, oh, who cared if you're Polish or Lithuanian and we had Armenians on our street. We had a variety of people. We went to school with uh, a lot of Eastern European, uh, well, there's some Eastern Europeans, but um, we went to school with a lot of Western Europeans, but the neighborhoods in Detroit, there was a lot of different people, you know, different cultures. Uh, which I, you know, I'm, I say to this day, I'm very grateful for that because I, I realize, well, people do things differently, but it's okay. You know, they might uh, re like celebrate different things at Easter time or you have a different language, different understanding of things. And it, for me, it's only made my life richer. I'm, I'm more tolerant, I believe, and I'm not afraid of something that's different. You know, the people are different than that. Did you have uh, childhood friends that were from different backgrounds? And uh, yes, different uh, I, on the block I played on, I had French, I ha had uh, Nova Scotian friends, I had um, Polish, more, several Polish friends. So there was, a, and I know there's other ethnicities on that street. There's other Irish in that. Okay, so now I want to talk about once you enter school, um, what, what were your first thoughts about school as you entered uh, kindergarten? Yeah, well, I uh, mentioned the other day to you guys too, uh, the first time I went to kindergarten, I started crying, so I was scared to go to school. But uh, once I got, you know, in school, I was okay, I enjoyed it. You know, the teachers were very, very good to me. I started in kindergarten, and I thought I, thought I got a very good, you know, kinder, uh, schooling from K to six at our public school. Um, uh, one thing that I, you know, and they don't do that anymore, and thank God, the one thing that was really unnerving to me, because I was afraid of them, we had at that time, and, and most schools had this, you know, people with special ed needs, they were always cordoned off. They couldn't come to the cafeteria with us. They walked different halls and that kind of thing. And, you know, there was part of me that felt sorry for them, because, you know, I didn't know why, you know, they were, they, I knew they were different. But I didn't know why, you know, why they had to be so separated. In this day and age, we don't do that. I mean, we just don't do that. You know, and I'm grateful we don't. But uh, that was one thing that was kind of frightening to me is why, you know, they're different and you keep them kind of in the background and that. So um, I, uh, again, I was involved in more ethnicities than that. But I, uh, anybody that was like physically different or emotionally or mentally different, they tried to keep those away from us. So you mentioned that uh, your stay at. It was Bennett School. Correct. Uh, so that transition from Bennett School to All Saints Academy, uh, public school to Catholic, Catholic school. Uh, yeah. school, how was that transition like? Well, at, at first it was hard because I didn't know any of the kids. And then at time, as time went on, I got to know the kids, and I, it was really a favorable experience. Uh, part of it was I didn't have to go to CCD classes on Monday night anymore. We had them in school, so I didn't have to go after school to CCD. Uh, that's Christian doctrine classes. Um, and I, I got to know the kids. Uh, we had kids in our school from, uh, you know, southwest side of Detroit and then from the suburbs like Lincoln and Allen Park. So there um, uh, wasn't a lot of tension. I mean, at that time, you know, they were uh, the suburban kids, but there wasn't like, I think we're now in a situation with suburban kids that are <laughs> lots and lots and lots of money. And, you know, other kids, you know, city kids that don't have lots. Of, we didn't have those problems. I mean, we, you know, nobody talked about, oh, they've got money or those are the city kids. For some reason, that wasn't brought up. And, you know, we got along very well. So, right. uh, so now I want to ask, as a child, uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I think very early on, a teacher, and then eventually I decided I wanted to become a nun. I, we were taught by nuns. Uh, we were taught, I was taught by the Immaculate Heart of Mary nuns in Monroe, Michigan. Um, and my junior teacher uh, mentioned a book that I might like, and that was The Challenge of the Retarded Child, and that was the language that was used then. And um, I read that book, and I said to her, well, maybe I could go volunteer there. Well, that was in Jefferson, Wisconsin. That's just a little bit outside of uh, Madison. So I took a bus all the way there and spent three weeks uh, my junior year volunteering there. And uh, I was very convinced after I left there I'd like to join that community. And I predominantly thought that I'd spend the rest of my life with special needs kids, but that changed. So, <laughs> so you eventually moved, did move to, uh, to Jefferson City, right? Jefferson, I just lived there during the summer. During the summer. Yes. So and then I went back to Detroit, graduated from high school. And 
that was when you decided, decided you wanted to be an actor. Correct. Uh, what, so that transition from that, that you eventually did make, what was, uh, what was something different about the lifestyle of the sisterhood? Okay, very rigid and demanding. You know, where you're up at 4.30, 5 o'clock every morning, never spoke in the morning. You went downstairs and prayed. You never spoke after that. Uh, you came upstairs and did your work. Never spoke during that time. Then you had breakfast, and after breakfast you could speak. So it was a few hours you never spoke. After uh, the last prayer at night, you never spoke either. So it was quiet. It was hard for me because I like to talk, so it was hard for me. Um, no, con Well, you, had, you could write to your parents, but you had very little contact with your parents. Uh, very little contact. Uh, uh, we went to Cardinal Stritch. That was a school the sisters owned. Um, and we weren't supposed to have too much contact with the college kids and that, but I did. You know, it's kind of outgoing, and, and I'd sometimes get in trouble for that. Because <laughs> um, we can't, couldn't go to their rooms. We weren't supposed to eat with them, all that stuff, and I just couldn't understand that. So, uh, so it was a very different, and I was, you know, I was the only one there, again, from Michigan. I didn't know any of the people I was going in class and going to the community with. So that was a major transition for me. You, you mentioned that there was very little contact with your, with your family outside sure. of, uh, of, of your... Letter writing, of your yeah, writings. yeah. Uh, well, was it hard for you uh, to, to be separate from your family? Yes, it was, because um, Milwaukee was Milwaukee, and Detroit was Detroit. You know, all my high school friends were there. They were going to college by that time. And uh, I didn't. I was. I wasn't able. I could write to them, but I wasn't able to k keep up with them as much as I would have liked to. And we did our f uh, first year in the convent. We could go home for Christmas, and the second year I think we had like a week or so, maybe a week, no more than that. And then, according to the old rules, and we fortunately they changed them while we we're in this. Uh, after that second year, you couldn't go home for five years. So, uh, but then they changed them. And, and part of that is, I don't know if I've mentioned that, is Vatican II. Vatican II came along and a lot of things changed, okay? So um, it got, the community life got a lot more human, let's put it that way. So that was a big plus for me. So were you, well, how did your parents feel about it? Were they just, um, were they just as, uh, did they, did they agree with the fact that you chose a sisterhood? Yes, they didn't mind that at all. In fact, they, I think for them and for many families, that was an honor. They had a son that was a priest or a daughter that was a sister. And in my family, on the same weekend, my older brother went into the priest of the Capuchins, and I went into the Franciscans in Milwaukee. So it was the same weekend. So. Okay, so you mentioned uh, your life in college. You, mm -hmm. uh, you went to Cardinal Stridge. Correct. So UWM. Um, was there ever a desire for you to have that full college experience, or or were you committed for the sisterhood? Uh, I think that uh, there was sometimes. I you know I know the kids would be going on Friday night and stuff like that, and we're we're going home, you know, and having our prayers and stuff, and just taking it easy. Um, so I missed some of that. Uh, I mean, I didn't pine about it all the time, but I, I did miss it. Yeah, I still wanted to be a sister, but I also missed that. Um, were you involved in, in your time even in uh, All Saints Academy and, and uh, going on to, to college? Were you involved in any organizations, any clubs? Yeah. The big thing that I was, you know, I was in Sodality in high school. I worked on the yearbook. But the big thing that I enjoyed, and of course, you know, I think it's really stayed with me all my life, was it was called the Junior Roundtable. And it was a, it was a city group of young people they got together and talked about, you know, uh, different racial tensions, uh, how do you incorporate other people, that kind of thing. So um, that was, a, I like that the best of all the things we did. So you mentioned you were very, very much involved with uh, racial tensions. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you, you were aware of the, you know, the climate, the social climate of, of, of the country and mm -hmm. especially here in Milwaukee. What would, what would you say was uh, uh, overall feeling uh, as you were a college student in, in Milwaukee? Okay. Um, uh, fear, uh, especially when we went into, um, at that time we lived at the convent on South Lake Drive, but for, for one summer they, the convent was full, so we had to live at the seminary. 
And those, we lived through, um, uh, I want to say boycott, it's not a boycott, but uh, I'm, I'm going to miss the word here, but it was, you know, you had to be in the house at a certain time and all that stuff. Yes, yes. Uh, the riots and then the sanctions that they gave us for the riots that you couldn't get out at night and that kind of thing, curfew. And, uh, you know, you, you, we were, you know, again on South Lake Drive and we weren't in the middle of town or anything, but um, you were concerned. You were concerned. Um, and you have to keep in mind, too, that I was very concerned about Detroit because my mom and dad and two brothers by that time were living in Detroit and uh, still living in Detroit. And uh, uh, we had a park not terribly far from our house, and that was all military. They had brought in tanks and all this stuff in Detroit. You know, and it, it scared me. I thought, you know, there's tanks at the park near us. And uh, it was, and I was, I was afraid for my parents and my brothers. I mean, I didn't know, you know, how far away this was, was, you know, where was the rioting, all that stuff. So it did scare me. And Milwaukee didn't scare me as much as Detroit did. Because, you know, well, I don't think there was many tanks in, in Milwaukee or anything like that, but Detroit really got, you know, the National Guard and all those folks in. So, what did you, what did you study for, uh, to be, you obviously studied for, to be a teacher. Sure. Uh, what, what specific, um, you know, majors did you take? Um, uh, I studied, well, I had, one major was English, and then I had a minor in theology, philosophy, sociology. I think that was it. And education. So I had four minors. So uh, I was prepared for just about anything at that point. <laughs> so now I want to speak about your you know, professional life here. Sure. As you entered, uh, you did enter into teaching. teaching. Yes. So where, where do you begin your teaching career, and what was the experience like? Okay, um, I remember uh, being involved with Father Grappi and the marches and that, and after I was done with that, um, I started teaching at St. Michael's in their CCD, that's Christian Doctrine classes, on Saturday mornings. So I did, and that was predominantly African American, I think there's one little boy that was white was in there, and I used to do that every Saturday. and. Um, uh, I did my student teaching in Glendale, and that was with littler kids, uh, three, two, three, four. And then eventually I went to junior high, and that was out at St. Joseph's in Grafton. And beyond that, and I mean, I liked all those experiences. I particularly liked St. Michael's. That was kind of a great place. That was fa where Father Grappi's parish was. Uh, beyond that, I was at uh, St. Joe's Grafton for two years, and then I went on to Mesmer High School which I liked, you know, a great deal. I mean, it was all those activities going on. Kids were really crazy. And, um, and it was a challenge because at that point, Mesmer had been white, predominantly white for many, many years. And those were the years when they were starting to integrate. And there was tension. I mean, there was tension. Uh, I was a junior moderator and uh, uh, the only way we could survive homecoming decorations was the black kids wanted one wall and or one hall and then the white kids took the other hall. And then everybody was happy. They got what they wanted. But there was tension. It was a tense time. And that was beyond the riots and that. That was in the 80s. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was in the middle 70s, end of the 70s. So you mentioned uh, you, had, um, you, you, you knew Father Grappi, Father James Grappi, yes. uh, who was, a, was an avid supporter of the civil rights movement Correct. in Milwaukee. Um, what what did you think of him when you didn't know him, and yeah. uh, did he? How did he inspire you uh, in terms of racial integration as mm -hmm. you moved on to other schools? Yeah, I think you know his biggest message. You know, and I wasn't you know a personal friend of him. I mean, I knew him, and I was in the marches with him. But I was I always respected the fact that nonviolence, nonviolence. Don't you know? Don't get involved in violence on these things. People say things to you. You know, leave it and just keep going. And uh, I, of course, I respect a great deal of respect for Martin Luther King Jr. also because he was that non And that nonviolence is tough stuff because people are spitting at you. And I was never spat at, but I had friends that was, um, you know, and to keep your cool, you know. And I remember some, even the walks here, you know, I remember one man coming up to me and saying, I was with a bunch of adolescent boys, and they said, just keep them cool. I said, oh, I don't know if I can. He said, just, you know, if they get going, just calm them down some, keep walking with them. So um, I appreciate that, you know, don't fight back, 
just keep walking, you know, you walk for what you think is true. So I respect that a lot. So once you did move on, move on uh, to different schools, um, what were your uh, favorite experiences in these schools or yeah. favorite memories? Yeah. Uh, I think just the kids and the teachers at Mesmer was a lot of fun. I mean, it was, you know, I was young and they, I had a lot of young teachers with me and it was a lot of fun. The kids were, you know, crazy and um, so I really liked that and I liked co-ed. I mean, I, you know, it was co-ed and I liked that. Um, coming here to Marquette, I liked Marquette in terms of the big, the major thing for me was the respect of the faculty. The faculty was just a strong, strong group and r r really dedicated to the kids and had some really very good strong administrators which was very helpful. Uh, I was, at the time I came, uh, there was three women in the building, the librarian and two of us in English full-time, okay. We also, ha oh, there's m we had a part-time art teacher and a part-time science teacher and that was it. So they were really trying to start getting w more women in the building so um, was there a lot of sexism at that time? Oh yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's gotten better, but still there's little corners we have to get around, okay? But yeah, that was one thing, uh, you know, and I didn't anticipate that because I hadn't been in a situation, you know, uh, uh, all the other places I taught were co-ed. So that was something that I had to deal with. And it was hard because you'd say, well, why would you say that? And you know, most of the men had no clue. Now, it's much different now. I mean, it's much, much different. But at the time, and when I came here too, just to give you an idea, there were 35 priests and 35 lay people. I mean, that's what we have, I don't know, four or five priests now, or, and you know, the rest are lay people, you know. So it's very different, you know. So um, uh, kids were much different than a lot of the kids. Uh, mom stayed at home. Now a lot of the kids, in fact, majority of the kids' parents, both parents work. Um, and I think the boys have taken on more responsibility when both parents work because they sometimes have to make their lunch, they sometimes have to do their laundry, that kind of thing. So uh, it was different in terms of, uh, you know, very few women and lots and lots of young boys that were, you know, um, uh, pretty much catered to by their mom, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, that changed a lot as time has gone on, so. So you mentioned the sexism. Yeah. Uh, you entered Marquette High in the 80s? I came in 1978, yeah. Um, yeah. And I, you know, 80s and 90s, so I've been around for a while. So did you see uh, kind of a, so you taught uh, in the, 70s. Yes. Uh, right after the civil rights movement, do you see a change in the education system uh, as integration did uh, um, become more? I don't know how to say it, but established. More established, yeah. acceptable. Um, uh, one of the reasons they hired me from Mesmer was because I, I dealt with African American kids, and they really wanted to, particularly Mr. Larry Seward, he really wanted to get teachers in here that could, de you know, to to deal with African American kids and to try to really ha ha get African American kids in the building because we had very few. There was not that kind of push with Hispanic kids because there's very few Hispanic kids out there at that point. Okay, now that's very different today. Yeah. Um, and but I think what, and even it's very different, but you know, there's a lot more Hispanic kids, but the Hispanic kids came through the Catholic tradition, a lot of them. And so maybe they went to the Catholic parish, or whatever, and they at least had heard about Marquette High School. Uh, a lot of our African-American kids might go to Baptist churches in various places, and we're not aware of the school. So we were you know, really trying to build up a clientele of African-American kids. So, um, uh, we didn't, there wasn't really a lot of tension, racial tension, because there wasn't different, you know, there wasn't a lot of different kids here. It was mostly white suburban kids, you know, or some middle class white too, so. No, I want to talk more specifically about Market High. You already spoke about your time in Market High. But, uh, so you've been here for quite some time. Yes. Um, now be nice to me. Oh, no, no. <laughs> hey, that's fine. Uh, just, I, I know, I know you're very respectful. Please. That's fine. Um, how did you, in what aspects has Marquette High changed throughout the years? You already mentioned some like yeah. sexism. Some integrate more, trying harder to get in, in, be more integrated. 
uh, I think a very, very good thing this past year has been um, uh, getting ahead of diversity. Um, uh, Renee, and I can't think of his last name, but Renee, um, what is his last name, Tim? Howard Pius. Yes. Uh, Howard Pius. I think he's a real, real uh, substantial contribution to the school. He's not willing, to, he's not afraid to ask questions and stuff, which I think we have to do. Um, so that, you know, um, I think, and I, I don't, I mean, I, this is what I think. I think a lot of the racism we have here is subtle. Um, you know, I'm in the library most of the time, and, you know, every once in a while when different music comes on, you know, like you'll have African American Month or Week or whatever, or Hispanic Week, whatever. And I remember one day with the Hispanic Week, you know, you had your m uh, Hispanic music on, and this kid was going, you know, well, well, you know, and I, I just, well, I yelled at him. So, because um, I, I think, you know, they think it's funny, or some kids think it's funny, and I don't know if everybody else does, you know. And of course, they, oh, I'm being funny. I'm, I said, well, I don't know that that's funny, you know. So, um, so I think there's a lot of, uh, there's some, maybe it's a lot, but I know there's some, uh, racism uh, in the school that's vi but it's very uh, let's say shelved or called or uh, uh, covered up or whatever but it's there so what, what do you say that it has evolved in that way uh, from your uh, beginning years um, I think the more minorities we got yes the more it's you know it's not nice to say it's out loud but I'll say it to my buddies that kind of stuff black and Hispanic okay um, I don't cater to it, I don't agree with it, but I think that that goes on, you know. And, and again, there's a lot of kids, I want to make that clear, there's a lot of kids here that do not do a thing like that, but there's other kids that do. Um, so, during your time at Marquette High, you, you taught theology? Yes. You said you also taught English? English, worked in guidance for a while, yeah. So, uh, again, I'm a speak about memories. Uh, what, what are some of your favorite memories uh, in your time here in Marquette? Sure. Uh, English I liked a lot. We had a real strong English department. I, you know, Mr. Carney was hired a couple years after me. I was with Mr. Prosser, Mr. Carney, and we just had a real, real strong group of people that liked each other and had a lot of fun. And of course, we were, you know, much younger. Um, uh, and very well-educated English teachers. I mean, we could sit there and talk about books and all kinds of stuff. It was just really wonderful. And uh, uh, out of English, I went into some theology, and then after, well, I was in theology for a while, and then I went to guidance for a while, and I came back to theology. Theology was good, but it was always, you know, a challenge, because uh, that isn't the favorite thing for the kids. They're not really hep on that, but I, I believe that we have to teach it, and I believe that, you know, and I try to make it interesting, but it was more of a, more of a challenge than English. You know, I enjoy teaching, and I enjoy th theology, too. I try to make it interesting, but it was a harder sell, okay? So, do you have any, uh, do you have uh, very close relationships with your students, uh, with your, with, um, yeah, just with your yeah. students? I think so, unless, you know, you know a kid much better in a classroom, because you see him every day. Uh, although in the library, um, I do see kids, you know, and uh, they'll come up and talk and that. So I think I have a pretty good established relationship. Uh, what's uh, happening now, too, is a lot of kids are sitting in the library. A lot of those kids are wandering around here. I had their dads. So and it's, there's been times when I've called them their dad's name. So uh, fortunately, some of them think it's funny. Some don't. So, but, um, uh, so yeah, I, I've kept contact with several kids. So, yeah, I, I, I think I have made good connections. And good connections with parents too. So, All right. um, so your career as a teacher, um, you you liked it? Yes, there were moments. Uh, you know, I think with any career, you have your ups and downs. But I thought I did okay. Yeah. And do you, do you, so now you're a retired teacher. And I'm, you're a librarian. Yes. Do you ever feel a desire um, to go back to teaching, or is it just? I think I'm, I was done when I retired. That was four years ago from teaching. Um, and as I said, there's a challenge of theology, and there was times I'd look out at uh, those kids, and they were not interested, and I thought, I don't know what else I can do. Um, so I, I was happy to do that. And now, you know, I've been in the library four years, and I'm going to retire, you know, from the library this summer, and, or in May. 
And uh, I, I just know now I'm done with that too. So now I'm, it's all for my time. So, yeah. So during your time at Marquette High, were you the only nun to... to okay, at that time I had left the community. I, I was no longer a nun. I left the community when I was oh. teaching at Mesmer. Mm -hmm. So I was hired as a laywoman here, yeah. Okay. Um, but go ahead if you have a question beyond uh, that. I was, I was gonna say, did, did, did the students have a sort of respect for you for, um, for being a part of the sisterhood yeah, at yeah. the time of your life? Um, yeah, not here, I mean not here, not that they disrespected yeah. me, but they, I was not a sister here. And I think there was that respect in when I taught junior high in Grafton and you know, CCD and at Mesmer. Now, at Miss where I made the transition, then they allowed me to stay there and they, I was still employed. Um, but I didn't see the kids treating me any different, you know. So, in fact, I think I kept my name until I left Miss where it was Sister Janai at that time. So. All right, so now I want to talk about, you know, the city of Milwaukee. Sure. Um, you spent a lot of time here in Milwaukee? Yes, I spent uh, most of my life, or not, yeah, most of my life in here now, yeah. Well, uh, what, were some, uh, what were some places that you really enjoyed going to? Okay, I always liked the water, like the lake. I liked to enjoy, enjoy the lake. I like downtown, and I think downtown's even getting better and stronger, and I like that. Um, I always marvel at the parks we had in Milwaukee, because we didn't have anything like that in Detroit. So I like the parks. Um, Cultural activities. Uh, I'm not too keen on baseball, but a friend of mine is, so I'm at the park now more than I've ever been. So I, I'm at, you know, for the Brewers. Uh, uh, football games, you know, things like that. So, so, so you mentioned a comparison to the Detroit. I want to kind of do, do that sort of thing right now. Um, in what ways are the, the cities um, similar? Okay. Uh, it could be anything. And what ways are they, uh, are they different? Okay. I think uh, well, something like Detroit. One thing about Detroit was there were African Americans there. But very early on, Henry Ford had them living in a certain area. If you wanted to work at you know, Ford, you lived in a certain area. So they really were ghettoized. Okay. Um, seemed to me that there were more ethnicities, and it wasn't like in here in Milwaukee, you had the Germans over here, the Poles over here, the Italians there, the Irish there. Um, like now, we have African Americans predominantly in one group, uh, Hispanics predominantly. That wasn't going on. I, I'm not sure why. And of course, this is my time. Now, you know, a lot of people pulled out of Detroit, and so I don't know exactly what's going on there at all now. Um, but uh, in that, you know, there was more inclusivity in Detroit when I was a kid growing up, okay? Um, and there wasn't that here. I mean, because you're pretty much segregated in your own groups in various parts of the city. Uh, I know when I first went out to Grafton, people said there's a lot of German people out there, and there were. You know, that was a, a, a strong a German area out there, farmers and that. Um, and you know, that it didn't strike me funny, but I thought, oh, a German school. I, so, but uh, that wasn't going on in Detroit, so that was different. Uh, far, and you know, we had far more of a melting pot in Detroit because of the automobile. I mean, a lot of people from all over the country, from the south, from the east, came out to Detroit to get work. So you had people from all over the place coming there. And I think that made a significant difference too. We had work here, and I think from the south we had a lot of people coming up for, you know, it was factory jobs and things like that. But it wasn't, you know, the melting pot that Detroit was. So your family was in Detroit while you were you were here in Wisconsin. Sure. Um, were they were they in Detroit while you were here in Milwaukee? Yes. Okay. Um, and they lived at Detroit during the Civil Rights Movement. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. And did they tell you some things that happened in Detroit during the Civil Rights yeah. Movement that didn't happen here, or some things that happened here that didn't happen? Uh, my dad didn't talk much about it. He disagreed with it, of course. My mom didn't say anything, but my older brother would talk to me about it. You know, this is what's going on. And again, I think there was more violence in Detroit at the time. And what happened in Detroit, too, was people said, we're not putting up with this and pulled out of there. So what happened was you just had a, you know, a very poor, poor group of people left in Detroit. 
And then, of course, it went bankruptcy lately, and you know, it's really been a tough situation. Um, so there were some uh, differences in that. Uh, but again, we're a different city in that you know, we really still are segregated, and uh, people live among themselves and survive among themselves. Um, and Detroit wasn't exactly like that, but they just got out of there. I mean, people just went out the suburbs, they went north, you know, they, in Detroit, they just left. So, um, but again, I think it was more violence in Detroit, you know, and, you know, as I say, I didn't hear about any tanks being in parks around here or anything like that. So, in Milwaukee, um, what, what, again, uh, I'm going to ask, what were some of the things, some of the, the activities that you like to, like to do here in Milwaukee? Okay. You, maybe you didn't have a chance to do in Detroit or anything. Okay. Now you have to keep in mind it was 18 when I went to the convent, so I there was I couldn't go to bars in Detroit and all that kind of thing. Um, there is some of the you know the bar situation here, Mark. I don't do it so much anymore, but there are, you know local bars and stuff. A lot more local bars than it was in Detroit. Okay, that's one thing. Um, uh, now, but uh, when I first came here, it wasn't. But the ethnic, you know, the, the um, Summerfest. That was not anywhere started when I first came here. I don't think they have anything like that in Detroit. You know, there wasn't when I was a kid anyways. Um, uh, there seemed to be, and again, it was a big city, had a lot of money, Detroit, because of the automobile industry. Uh, more emphasis on the arts and uh, like, you know, uh, Art Institute, ballet, music. A symphony downtown uh, than Milwaukee has, but I think that's grown now. But uh, and again, you know, the arts grow with money being backed by money, and there was a lot of big money in Detroit. I mean, you had Ford Motor Company, you had General Motors, you had all those uh, big, big industries around in and around Detroit, you know, in Michigan. So, so there was uh, more of that. Um, a, a lot of us went uh, we, in, during the summer. We went. In a, to a, well, my family did, to, to the north, about 200 miles north of Detroit in, in a lake, went to a lake. So I was not in, in the city with my friends during the summer, so I was up there, but, um, uh, so I didn't do a lot of city stuff during the summer. So I want to talk now more about your, you know, current life interests. Sure. Um, uh, what, what do you like doing in your spare time? Now that you're a retired teacher, okay. you're, you're a part-time librarian, what, yeah. what, what would you like to do yeah. uh, in your free time? Well, I do, you know, the arts. I, I, I go to the Milwaukee Symphony, I go to the Milwaukee Rep, uh, I do some sports, I do a lot of reading, I take care of an unruly dog who likes to rule the house, but she doesn't get away with it all the time. Um, my neighborhood's changed drastically insofar as it was all older people. And now I'm in Bayview, and that's kind of a hot spot in Milwaukee. So a lot of young couples are uh, moving in with young kids. So now there's a lot of young kids around. And I enjoy that little kids running around and playing and stuff. So I enjoy getting outside and seeing them. I like to garden. Uh, that's another way to get to see the neighbors. In the winter, you don't see many, very many people. Uh, I like to go out to eat. There's a lot of places in Milwaukee, or in Bayview in particular, that have nice restaurants now. Uh, I think that's about, I like to travel, uh, but that's outside of Milwaukee, but I like a lot of, I've done a lot of traveling, so. So you mentioned uh, you did sports, uh, did you always do sports throughout your life, or? Um uh, well, I was a spectator, I wasn't involved, oh. I mean, we had gym and stuff, but I, you know, uh, but I did enjoy, like, our high school basketball team and going to that, those games, and, uh, uh, once I got here, you know, I relinquished the Detroit Lions and became a Green Bay Packer fan. Uh, but uh, yeah, I do, I do like sports. I, am I, do I know I'm talking about it a lot of times? No. And I thought that when this friend of mine keeps taking me the games, she'll say, well, now this is why this is important. I think, really? All I thought was you hit the ball and that was it. I mean, then there's a lot more of the game than just hitting the ball and running. I'm just, so I'm learning a lot about that. We're in Detroit was a big hockey, hockey town. So I know a little bit about hockey. It was nowhere near, uh, I mean, here is nowhere near what is there. In Detroit, when you go to a hockey game, you're, you've got your suit on, you're all dressed up. It's very, very different. And they won several Stanley Cups, so it was a big thing in Detroit, so. Okay. 
So now I want to ask about the. Uh, um, so we are having some tensions in current, you know, um, current day. Yes. Um, obviously not to the to the extreme, but the civil rights movement era, civil rights era. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any um, similarities in the city, in this this city, or even in? life in general uh, mm. that are brought up again or what are some well I think you know it's a 50 years here in Milwaukee now for civil rights and <clears throat> there have been various programs and things going on uh, have we moved ahead I think some ways I think that some in our, our school in particular um, there are African-American kids here now that are middle class. When we w originally started, I, there might have been some that I didn't know of, but we had a lot of kids that were very poor that went here. Now we've got middle class, the parents really respect the place and want their kids to go here, that kind of thing. So we are making small, you know, movements towards that. I mean, the same with Hispanic parents. They, they, this is a good place, let's get them in there, you know. Um, yeah, whether they be poor or middle class or whatever, you know, it's a priority for parents. They want their kids to succeed, okay? Um, I am concerned about, you know, Black Life Matters because I don't know that they do, you know, with some kids. I mean, I, I don't understand why you have to shoot some 11 times. You know, I, just, I don't understand that stuff. And, and again, I'm, I'm not there on the scene or anything, but I don't, I just, you know, like in Ferguson, Missouri, so, I, I, don't, I don't know why we have to go crazy with some of that stuff. And I don't know if the police are uh, well-trained, and it's tough, uh, well-trained in terms of mental illness. Now, you know, if somebody comes after you like with a knife or something like that, starts yelling and carrying on and stuff, that's, a lot of times that's mental illness. They're not coherent, or it could be drugs. But I wish our police were trained better so they wouldn't, you know, um, <coughs> uh, react the way they do. I can't bring up the specific span experience, but I just remember I have a reaction in Canada not too long ago, and it was so different than what's here. You know, with, it was a group of, I think, African Amer American people, not African American, but Africans that were from Africa, and the experience was so different. There wasn't the violence. I remember it was a man that, oh, he was the man that drove that car and ran those, all those people over. Gets out of the car, and the cop talks him down. He doesn't shoot him. He doesn't start, you know, waving his gun or anything. And the guy, the guy surrendered. You know, and everybody said, well, I want you to shoot him on the spot and stuff like that. So I don't know if they're trained differently or whatever. I mean, you know, you don't know if this guy's a terrorist, if he's got, you know, and they actually talked him down. And then I don't know if he actually had a gun either, but it looked like a gun. And so it was, you know, shoot, shoot. And the police didn't. And that was, I thought, my gosh, that's so different than here, you know. So um, I'm hoping, and I think, you know, we're still living in a lot of racist society yeah. All right, so on a lighter note. yes <laughs> um, you mentioned before that you would like to travel sure um, you also mentioned that you traveled to Canada what other places um, um, well did, did you have you tra traveled to I've traveled to Canada I've traveled to Japan I've traveled to um, Ireland Germany Switzerland <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where else? Europe. <coughs> oh, I've been to Lithuania, uh, to Czechoslovakia. Some of those countries I went to um, on a trip that visited the camps, the concentration camps. That was very, very powerful. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm coughing here. But um, we went specifically to those countries, Lithuania. They didn't have the camps there. That's where they just shot them and threw them in holes. And just the whole understanding of the Jewish and how we didn't like them. Uh, so um, in the Czech Republic, so some of those countries. Poland, Poland. I like Poland. I was at Poland. <coughs> so. so now I want to talk, and I'll kind of shift the gears here. I'll crazy, okay. I want to talk. I want to talk about uh, the Hispanics and even other different ethnic groups that you have worked with before. Okay. The African Americans, uh, even you know, white. Um, 
how has each ethnic group kind of evolved? You already kind of touched on it, you know, bits and pieces throughout the interview. Sure. But how has each ethnic group kind of evolved throughout time and to the current day? Well, as I say, I, I think there's one Hispanic, there was one black kid in my high school too, and then my class and graduating class, and one, they're both males, and one Hispanic kid. Uh, uh, and that's changed drastically in Detroit too now. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have much contact with Hispanic folks, and literally no contact with black folks, I mean, in Detroit, I just didn't. Um, as time went on, I do know one thing, that my mother had a, a woman come into the house, it was Mrs. Uh, Reed, and she'd do cleaning and that once a week, and I really, really liked her there. She was the African-American. So I, that was one African-American I got to know quite well when I was in high school. And then, um, of course, we didn't, in, in teaching situations, like at uh, St. Uh, Michael's and um, Mesmer, some of those places I got to know African Americans more. And I, uh, for years and years and years, I've known Mr. Gillen, so that's always been a real help to me to, you know, if I have questions and stuff, he'll answer them. Um, uh, Hispanic kids, I kind of grew into it. One of the first things that happened to me is I got into brother, big brothers and big sisters, and I got a Hispanic little sister. And so, you know, I go to her house and pick her up and stuff, and I learned very, very early that, uh, you know, uh, I'd say, well, no, I don't need a you know, coffee or anything, and i got to get home. And I was getting my master's, so I was pretty busy. Uh, but then I realized that that was an insult to them, you know, that they want to just sit down and have your coffee and stuff. So that was very, that was very, very good for me. And uh, I also learned, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before, too, the, the whole idea in the Hispanic family, how important manners are, you know, that... Uh, that story about the dad that uh, I, poor kids really tank in here, you know, in, in church history. And I'm saying, well, we'll get them through, we'll get them through. And the priority for the dad was not that great. The priority for the dad is, is he polite to you. I mean, that was so important to him. I said, oh, you kid, he was great, you know. But we had to get him through that class, too. So, but, um, you know, I realized that that's a real priority. Uh, close knit families, African Americans, there's a lot of very close knit, -knit families. I remember once for a class at UW, you know, we went to an African-American church and how welcoming those people were, it was amazing, you know. So, um, yeah, so uh, I think once you get to know these people, uh, it's not those people over there, oh, it's my neighbor. And my friend lives in Berkeley and I think that's always been such a shock to me because she has black people living on her street, Chinese people living on her street, there's Gu their Park Guatemalan, I mean, there's all kinds of people. You know, and we don't have that experience here. I think if we had that experience, particularly in Milwaukee, uh, I think it would be easier to say, you know, to get to know, you know, what, who's a Chinese person, who's a black person, uh, you know, who's that family, what, you know, that kind of thing. I would say when I was in, in grade school in, in um, Detroit, there was a f much wider diversity of kids than there was when I was in high school. You know, there were Chinese kids in there. There's Armenian kids in there. There was, you know, Polish, Lithuanian. Uh, Lebanese, there was a wide variety of kids, you know, so, um, but I think that, you know, in terms of answering that question, I, um, uh, I've learned of African Americans and have friends, you know, through here and through other places and then, you know, through big brother and big sister for Hispanic kids and then Hispanic kids being here, you know, so. So now, I, again, I want to be jumping around. Um, <laughs> Just the life here at Market High, and just you've mentioned many, many aspects that has changed. And, uh, you know, the people here, the students here. Um, has it always been as, um, I, don't, I don't know how else to describe it, like, hate, in a way, patriotic, but for your school? Is, has it always been like Oh, that? yeah, a school tradition, yeah, yeah, and school spirit and stuff, yes. Um, as time has gone on, though, I've noticed that uh, with sports and that, if we don't win, people don't show up. And we did have more winning teams, I mean, early on. I think part of the reason we don't have a lot of that right now is because, you know, kids can't do much more. I mean, that you've got the academics, you got some kids have to work. They just don't have time for sports. And uh, so, you know, we don't feel the teams we used to. Now, something like soccer we do, you know, but... 
uh, in terms of uh, you know other things, I, I think kids just they can't do much more without going crazy, you know, because they got a lot of stress. So I think that's part of it. But also, you know, it was a big thing: football on Friday nights, and you know, basketball games. Some kids that go to baseball they used to have it in the spring, uh, and I think they're going back to that actually. Um, but in, in attendance was really pretty big, and that's not going on anymore. You know. And I don't know if it's because they're losing or if kids just don't think sports are that important. I don't know. Okay. So you taught at MU and MATC. What was yes. That, what was that experience like? Okay. Uh, MU, Marquette University, I taught at several summers, and I was in the Economic Opportunity Program. And again, it was another program to try to get kids into MU uh, to get their college experience. And they might have needed to be brushed up on you know, their skills in English. I taught English or various things. A couple summers I taught um, uh, in the actual college program. That was the um, economic opportunity program. Part of the economic opportunity program also was Upward Bound, and that was for high school kids. So I taught English to several high school kids over the years uh, at MU. And I, I really enjoyed that. Part of the reason I enjoy it is we're working with people that really understood African American literature and various, you know, uh, different kinds of literature. And so we were teaching it. So I was reading it and, you know, teaching it. Um, one thing, a couple of years ago, I went on the, those, uh, that Civil War trip with Mr. Uh, Parsons and Mr. Lease. And we went to where Emmett Till was killed. He's a young African American kid that was, you know, literally killed because they said that he, you know, flirted with this woman in the store, which, you know, they've proven it wasn't true. And there was two men that got a hold of him at night and killed him and threw him in the water, in, you know, in the river. And I taught that book at MU. And then so, you know, once we went down there, I knew so much about that situation. Um, and it was things like that, you know, that had an impact. I mean, here's this kid that really... His mom sent him home, uh, sent him down from Chicago, you know, to be in Mississippi, so he's away from, you know, uh, the violence of the city, and, you know, he's killed down there. So um, that made a major impact on me in terms of that. I, I did uh, uh, begin to realize how important other, diff other uh, literatures were, and I think our English department still does that. I, I know Mr. Coston, some people really try to emphasize various literatures, whether it be Hispanic, whatever, authors. And I think that's so important, you know. You know. So, um, so I, that was one thing in my career that I really appreciated was these various, you know, people in the department introducing me to these works, and then we taught it. Um, at METC, it was a very, very good experience for me because you know, being here for so long, you're used to kids that, you know, are, you know, pretty sharp, okay? And then you get into a situation like that, and there's a lot of kids, uh, predominantly adults, they're going back to high school, and, you know, they really have very little skills, and so you have to bring them up to par on skills, and that was a very good experience, but you see how people, some of them were just so motivated, you know, to read and to write, and that really, that kept me in, and I think in tune with the world, you know, there isn't always, you know, as nice as it is here in terms of teaching and uh, uh, that and there's a lot more challenges out there. And I mean, <laughs> I've always had a deep respect for Milwaukee Public School teachers since then because they put up with a whole different ball game, you know. So, but uh, both of those experiences were very, very good for me. I taught at MATC at night and then sometimes in the summer. So both of those, you know, it just taught me about different groups, different understandings, and uh, other ways of teaching. You know, how do you get through to folks? You know, so um, uh, that was real good for me too. So, so there, this 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 experience kind of um, kind of shaped the, the way that you taught, like in in your careers um, following that, right? Correct. Um, and do you believe that these experiences kind of 
may it made it easier for you to have closer relationships with your students with a wider bar variety? Yes, I, I really do believe that I, I did. You know, and again, um, uh, it, it first of all, it, they realized, oh, this lady likes different things besides all white American books. I mean, I did, you know. And uh, also I acknowledge that there's, you know, another world out there, you know. And I think the English department still does a good job on, you know, like I see some of the kids reading The Invisible Man today and some of those, those books, and I think, well, oh, you know, that's really good to keep kids opening up their horizons, you know. So, um, and I also am very grateful, you know, when I first, uh, this is in the convent, when I first lived in the convent, um, we had, you know, we had kids with special needs that we, out at St. Colette's that we would go out and, and work with. We also, were, I lived one year with, at St. John's School for the Deaf, which is no longer open, but that opened a whole world for me too, of, you know, working with deaf kids. You know, it's, there are adolescents and there were, you know, but it, it helped me to realize, you know, um, you know, the wide variety of needs in a classroom. You know, so I was always grateful for those experiences too, because that just really opened up, uh, you know, a lot of things, and you know how to speak to people that you know can't hear well, that kind of thing. So those are really good experiences for me. Um, uh, and you know, St. Coletta's, that was cognitively stable. Actually, John F. Kennedy's uh, sister was there, and I met her a couple times. You know, and uh, she, you know was severely defected because she had that lobotomy. But, um, and she lived out there for many, many years. So, um, and that gave me an understanding too, you know, like with Special Olympics and, and things like that, you know, that uh, I think uh, this is kind of a jump, but uh, Mr. Farrell said one day, uh, people with other abilities. And it just kind of struck me, that really struck me that you know, with disability, no, people with other abilities. And, you know, uh, people with, uh, that are cognitively dis disabled do have other abilities, you know, and, you know, how do you reach them, you know? So um, my various experiences taught me, you know, there's a lot of people out there that learn differently. How can we reach them? I think that one of the, the things that Market High, uh, one of their best selling points is we teach you how to learn. So you walk out of here, because I've had so many kids come back and not, you know, say, oh, how, we like you so much. No, they talk about, you know, how easy college was because of what they got here. So, you know, the best thing we can do here is to teach you how to learn. And then once you walk out of here, you, you, you know how to learn. So, um, and, it, you know, I think a good school anywhere with disabled, with, you know, uh, hearing impaired, whatever, teach them how to learn. Yeah, so. Now I want to ask about just your overall life. Your, your, your what what are what are parts of your life that you cherish the most uh. or that you think are very influential? Like you just mentioned, um, uh, your work with the the, the disabled uh, yes. kind of formed formed your career. What other, what other parts of your life uh, kind of had that impact uh, 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 for your professional career and okay. personal career? I think part of it too, in the convent they'd move you around a lot. So I got to know various people and you know you had to get along with them. So that was important. That was you know how to get along with people you might not agree with. You know you still respect them but you might disagree with them. I think that's what's so hard right now in our world is you disagree with them so you hate them. And you can't do it that way. You can disagree with them, but you've got to respect them. So um, I worry about that a lot in our world today because, you know, how are we ever going to get along if, you know, I don't like you because you're such and such and forget it. You know, I'm not talking to you. That doesn't work, you know, if you want to really try to get along with other people. So um, I think uh, moving around, getting to know other people, getting to, you know, again, not always agreeing with people, but realizing, you know, that, uh, um, you know, they have a point of view too. They have a way of uh, coming at the world that might be not yours, but that they really respect the way they have of coming at the world. And you have to, you know, um, try to respect that. And sometimes it's very hard, but it's very important. Yeah. So I asked you about parts of your life. Now I, I want to ask about 
the city, Detroit, the city. Well, what do you like about that city? What's the best thing that you, what's your favorite part about Detroit and the time that you lived there? Mm -hmm. And then what's the favorite part of uh, Milwaukee and the time that, the, and the time that you lived there? And mm -hmm. what are the things that you hope change in the future? Yeah. Well, I, I haven't been back to Detroit in a while, but I do read a lot about it, you know, and it's really kind of a, it's a resurrecting city. I mean, it's, you know, there, there's really a lot of things going on. It's certainly not back to where it used to be. I mean, it, it never will be. I mean, partially because of the motor company. They don't have that kind of money to help the city anymore. Um, uh, I never saw Milwaukee like that because, you know, you didn't have this giant, Ford or you know GM or whatever uh, to help the city so um, you know smaller places smaller charities you know that they, they gave to charities uh, smaller businesses etc um, what I, I liked about um, what I'd like to see about Detroit now is, is their arts and that they've really grown again in some of those areas and I'd like to see that and I think maybe this summer I'll have a chance to get back there again um, what I like about Milwaukee is, um, you know, the fest, summer festivals. I like that because it, you know, just, you know, just learn a lot more about different people. Um, I like the cultural events that the city has. Uh, uh, some of the sports, you know, Green Bay's, and that's not Milwaukee, but some of the sports. Um, I like the friendliness of the people. You know, for the most part, you know, people are really very, very kind and they'll help you out in situations. I remember one time, it just really struck me. Um, I had, I was on, it was, a, I had, uh, I was driving east and I was going to turn south and this woman turned right in front of me and I hit the car. And, you know, I stopped and everything and it really was, I mean, she turned in front of me, okay. And again, fortunately, there were people there that saw this thing. Because she said to me, I changed lanes, and I hadn't changed lanes. And so, you know, people were there. They said what they saw, and all of a sudden, and all, of, and, and, you know, did what they had to do. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes back. He had gone down to the seminary on Lake Drive, dropped to send off for the basketball game. Comes back. He said, I was here. I had dropped my son off, came back, and told the cop what he saw. Now, that guy didn't have to do that. So, I mean, there are a lot of people that really reach out to each other people, you know, and I don't know if we hear a lot about that good stuff, but there are a lot, a lot of people in Milwaukee that are good to each other. And I, you know, I really, I appreciate that a lot. I think there was some of that in Detroit, but I, you know, I left there when I was 18. But as I get older, I, you know, I appreciate the people who will reach out to each other and help, you know. So, um, you know, any way you, you know, you can. So. Yeah, so what are the things that you, that you would, I know you haven't lived in Detroit uh, for a while now. Yeah. Um, but based on just the life that you were, uh, that you did live in Detroit, mm -hmm. what would change about that, and then what would you change about the life that you lived in, in Milwaukee? Uh, I don't know if I'd change much. In, well, you know, as a kid, you you know, you're kind of happy with what you got. Um, As an adult, yeah. uh, what, what will you change? Not uh, from the things that you've noticed now. Yeah, now. Okay. Um, in my own family, when I was growing up, it would have been easier if my dad was more, you know, open to different cultures. I think it would have been a much easier on my mother if she could have worked, you know, in the workforce somewhere because she liked doing that and she was bright enough to do it. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, I was grateful for the grade school and the high school I went to. Um, uh, I didn't have the um, experiences of, uh, well, I live with different kids in different cultures, um, but not with Hispanic or black. I mean, we very few, you know, we um, had very little, you know, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't blatantly, oh, well, there's those people over there. It wasn't that stuff, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a mixing. There was no mixing in, in Detroit. Um, not much mixing here. I think, you know, I live in Bayview and there's more mixing because more people are moving south into that. 
So I, I appreciate that. I've had more experiences here as an adult of knowing different people. So I like that better, you know. So, uh, and I'm, you know, traveling and stuff, I got to know different people. I think that's, I've had a lot of nice opportunities to know different people, so. Well, you've, uh, <laughs> you've talked a lot about literature and your, 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 your fascination for literature. And yes. And you were an English teacher. Um, what literature, is there a specific, like, book or piece of literature that you, that you really, that really feels like it calls to you? Yes. Uh, I think one of my favorite authors is Toni Morrison. She's an African-American writer, woman, and she's just one of my, my best people. I just, and you know, it's really interesting to me because most of, you know, the writing and reading and that, that I've done in my life is, you know, a good friend of mine will say, oh, read this book, it's really good. It was at MU, two uh, English teachers down there, one was African American and one was white, said to me, read this woman. And I'd never heard a male tell me to read a white, wo uh, a female book, a female author's book. And I, after reading the first one, their, uh, their eyes were, I uh, know that was somebody else. Um, I can't remember what her first one was, but I fell in love with her. And any time, she hasn't written much these day years, but yeah, she's my favorite, yeah. Yeah. I, I just uh, I just want to bring up that I just read a book of hers. Oh, did you? Yeah, The Origin of Others. I think it just came out. Ah. Uh -huh. um, it's very short, but I really liked her, uh, yeah. what she said about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was great. Um, so as you uh, moved on to your uh, during your te teaching career, mm -hmm. um, literature was something that you were teaching. Uh, was there some a uh, piece of literature that you specifically liked t teaching to your students? I liked uh, teaching uh, Huckleberry Finn because, you know, it showed a kid and it also dovetailed with theology because, you know, at one point he says, well, then I'll go to hell. You know, if I've got to throw him off the, you know, if, I, if he's going to get in trouble, uh, you know, I'm not going to let that happen. You know, he says about Jim the Slave. And it, it, it's a real moral moment. It's like, you know, I'll probably go to hell. I could get killed for this, but I'm going to protect him. And I really had a real big respect for that, a huge respect, and I do now uh, still. And it's where a kid thinks, you know, who cares about the color? This is a human being. And I, I've, I really respect that. So. Okay. So your theology classes. But what, what, what specifically, uh, did you try to incorporate literature into your theology classes? Um, did, were you given that kind of freedom? Or? Yes, we were. Uh, you know, we had a lot of freedom when I first started teaching here. Um, uh, I did uh, incorporate some literature in my classes. Um, you know, and what I learned, like with Toni Morrison, some of those women, Alice Walker, James Baldwin, I try to incorporate that with, you know, you know, morality. And uh, when I taught uh, the seniors uh, prayer and spiritual journey, I tried to teach more, you know, some Buddhism. We did yoga. We did a variety of things. And again, opening them out to other cultures and other ways people pray. Okay, now I didn't say you've got to pray this way, this is the way to do it, but just to say here's some other options, and if it helps you, that's fine. You know, and we have our tradition, what our tradition was. Of course, we did, you know, traditional prayers too. But um, uh, I guess I've always kind of uh, tried to incorporate other cultures in religion and in uh, English. Well, in English it was easier because you're reading about them, you know, so. But, uh, yeah, I, I did. And, you know, of course, understanding and accepting of other human beings, you know, morality, that's pretty important. So, you know. Well, kind, of, kind of to wrap, wrap things up here. Okay. Um, what, um, what personal, what, who would you use as an example for your life? A person, it could be uh, someone you know personally, or someone that you, that you knew, like James Grappy, or, or just, Anyone, anyone, who do you use yeah. um, as uh, an example to live yeah. your life Well, it, it was, uh, she just died recently. It was an Immaculate Heart of Mary nun that I had in high school. 
And, you know, she gave, she was the one that talked to me about, you know, that book that I read about the challenge of the retired child. So she had an influence on me for eventually teaching. And I really did want to be a teacher when I finally met her. Um, I kept contact with her all these years. She died in March and she was 99 years old. And uh, she was just, you know, uh, a good, another one, respectful, kind to other people, very knowledgeable. Um, she'd encourage me to read different things. Uh, she challenged me on some of my ideas, which I needed to be challenged on. Uh, just a very, very spirit-filled, kind, and, you know, woman that I always try to emulate. Uh, now do I always do that? I don't, but I try. You know, but I, I, you know, I had a great deal of uh, respect for her. Um, I remember saying to somebody one time, and, and that was the truth, I think I said, you know, in some ways meeting her, she saved my life. I mean, she put me on a different track and all that, and I, I think that it, that helped me a lot, so, yeah. Well, Pastor Clapton, thank you for doing well, this for us. And thank you. You guys, this is hard work, I mean, to sit here. And, so thank you.